Welcome, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle, and Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. And normally we come to you live from our lovely little house in Decatur, Georgia, but I'm coming to you live from my lovely little house in Atlanta, Georgia, just down the street. Um, we are not sadly able to gather together in person, but we are thrilled to be here tonight with two of my personal favorite writers of this generation. Um, and I imagine many of y'all feel the same. Um, we are joined by Margaret Wilkerson Sexton, who's gonna be our moderator and interviewer tonight. Margaret was born and raised in New Orleans, studied creative writing at Dartmouth College and law at UC Berkeley. Her most recent novel, The Revisioners, won an NAACP Image Award for outstanding literary work was a California Book Award finalist and was a national bestseller as well as a New York Times Notable Book of the Year. Her debut novel, A Kind of Freedom, was long listed for the National Book Award and the no Northern California Book Award, won the Crooks Corner Book Prize and was the recipient of the first novelist award from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. Her work has been published in the Paris Review, O, The Oprah Magazine, The New York Times Book Review, and many other publications. She lives in Oakland with her family, and we've been talking about all the all the fires there and everything that's going on. Um, so our if, if folks are watching from California, just know that we're our hearts are with you. And we're here tonight to celebrate the work of Yaga Yisi. Ya is a Ghanaian American novelist. Her debut novel, Homegoing, was published in 2016 and won her at the age of 26 the National Book Critic Circle's John Leonard Award for Best First Book, the Penn Hemingway Award for a First Book of Fiction, the National Book Foundation's 535 Honors for 2016, and the American Book Award. She was awarded a Vilsic Book Award for Creative Promise in Literature in 2020. And her new book that we're here to celebrate tonight, Transcendent Kingdom, is already on, on its way up the charts, gonna be bigger than big. Um, <laughs> so we're thrilled to be a part of this celebration. So I just wanna remind folks of our code of conduct. You can read that on the right. Um, and at the bottom of the screen, you all see a two very important buttons. One, the most important is this teal button where you can click to buy Transcendent Kingdom from Karis tonight. That button will also take you to buy Margaret's uh, book, The Revisioners, which is freshly out in paperback. So get that. Um, these books really do, you know, have things to say to one another. They, are, they can be sort of com in conversation with one another in good ways. Um, and then underneath that or just over a little bit is this ask a question button. Just pop in there at any time. You're not going to interrupt anybody if you put a question in there. We just want, want your questions. And then Margaret will ask your questions towards the end of the event. If you go in there and you see a question that's kind of similar to the one that you wanted to ask, just upvote it. Uh, instead of just re-asking it. So just vote for somebody else's question, even if it's like slightly similar to yours, and that way we'll make sure all of the questions get asked and answered. Um, so it is a real pleasure to have you both here. Thank you so much, uh, and I'm gonna let y'all take it away. Thank you, ER, that was so nice. It's so nice to see you again after um, seeing you in Atlanta in November, which was a, a lifetime ago. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> And thank you for all the participants for being here. Thank you, y'all, for this beautiful, beautiful book. I'm so excited mm -hmm. to talk about it with you. Thank so you. I, of course. So I was, we were talking before this went live about the fact that I met y'all in 2016, right when Homegoing had just come out. And I had you sign books for my twins. I don't know if you remember, they were like three-year-old twins. Oh. And you signed two books for them. I was blown away. I had just read the book and I had never at that time and I still haven't read a book that so thoroughly and poignantly conveyed the impact of the legacy of slavery in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we all could feel the trajectory that your career would take and, and we could all predict that. And as, as so many of us predicted, here we are. Your second book, Transcendent Kingdom is beautiful. And um, it is, it's a deep and nuanced reflection on immigration and race and addiction and mental health and so many other themes. Uh, it's so very different from Homegoing, which we'll talk about. Um, so very different, you know, it's, it feels quieter. It feels more ruminative. It's, it's definitely more narrowly focused. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so then, yeah, power is still there. And, and it's only that the power here is rooted in the depth and the intensity of this, of this one family's quiet struggle. And um, it was just, it was a pleasure to read. So congratulations. Oh, thank you so much, Margaret. That's really yeah. kind of you. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I I want to hear what the experience was like writing such a different book this second time. Yeah, it was really intimidating at first. I think um, there were homegoing. You know, even though it was really sprawling and um, ambitious and covered a lot of time, there were there were some kind of nice constraints that allowed me to. Um, think about structure in a way that um, made the book approachable. So because I knew that I wanted to cover around 350 years of history, um, I had almost like a mathematical approach to it. I knew how many chapters I needed to get from this point to this point. I knew how long I wanted each chapter to be. I knew roughly what um, points in history I was going to touch upon. Um, so there was um, just kind of a lot of built-in scaffolding for creating this book. And I had none of that with Transcendent Kingdom. Suddenly I was being thrust into the world of a single person, a single voice. Um, it's in first person. So I was really kind of limited to what she could see and feel and hear and know and remember. Um, and at first it just felt like too much freedom. Like I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know how to structure a book like that. Um, I'd only ever written in the first person for a short story length work. Like I'd never done a, a full novel like that. Yeah. Um, so it took me a while, I think, to wrap my head around structure, how to think about structure for a novel like this. Uh, I knew that I didn't want the kind of classic like narrative arc, inciting incident, falling, rising action, falling action thing. It didn't feel like that kind of a book. It was so memory laden um, yeah. that I felt like you know, her memories would keep creeping back in and um, and kind of changing the flow of the story. Um, but once I landed on, really on that first paragraph, once I got that first chapter down, I was like, oh, I think I, I, think I know what this is now. Um, and then I, I felt like I was in it. Okay, that's interesting yeah. that the, the ambition of Homegoing, which was so very ambitious, was, was confining in a way. And yeah. And yeah, and didn't feel as intimidating. I can see that. That makes sense. And mm -hmm. I was thinking one of the differences that I'd like to talk about um, was just how you explored race in each book. Like mm -hmm. you know, going, as you said, it was such a sprawling examination of the legacy of slavery, and you covered institutional racism. And in this one, we see racism. Um, but it's in such an insular mm -hmm. and private way, and it feels more modern in a way. Yeah. Um, and yet the interesting thing about it is to me that it, it comes off as um, as just as profound, like mm. impactful, even though it's just affecting this one person. And right. so um, I'm curious to hear you talk about the differences there. Yeah, I, I think that like if Homegoing is a book that is examining institutionalized racism, um, Transcendent Kingdom is a book that is is looking at that as well, but it's also looking at how internalized racism impacts the life of um, of these characters. So Gifty is a woman who is <laughs> I have a three year old. So no worries, everybody's everybody's welcome. Everybody's kids are welcome. Other adults in this house. So why am I the one who has to get the lollipop? But go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's all good. Um, so. Yeah, so I was thinking about the ways in which after having to deal with the forces of internal of uh, institutionalized racism in their lives, um, how this one particular woman in particular, uh, Gifty, uh, comes to internalize those forces. So there are so many moments in this novel um, where you see her striving in a way that makes it clear that she believes, um, mm -hmm. particularly in her younger years, that striving is the thing that is going to kind of bust her out of this um, system. Um, there's a 
a, a scene in the novel early on where um, she witnesses her brother who's playing soccer um, be called a racial slur. Um, and she and her father are not sure if the slur is just for her brother, if it's for all of them. Um, they're immigrants, they're new to this language, they're new to this country, they're new to kind of the, the rules of this place. Um, and her brother, Nana, goes out and plays the game of his life. Um, and they're really proud of him. The team rallies around him. And what the lesson that Gifty takes from that is that she says that she realizes that nothing but blazing brilliance is going to prove um, kind of their goodness. Um, and we all recognize that to be false. We know that's not going to save Nana, um, who, who falls victim to um, the heroin epidemic um, in this book. It's not going to save her father who ends up going back to Ghana because his time in America is miserable for him. Um, and it's not gonna save Gifty either. Um, but I think this book is kind of an investigation of internalized racism, of black respectability politics, of all of those things that we grew up hearing, like you have to be twice as good to get half as far. Um, and the ways that those things end up kind of crumbling in the face of institutionalized racism, in the face of the, the kind of massive scale of the system. Right. And you see the massive like pressure that Gifty is under and the chronic sense of otherness that she's feeling and the way she's trying to combat that with this e excessive performance. And you can just feel I think I think as a black woman reading it, I could just feel that weight, you know, mm -hmm. because it's just it, it's it's such an issue for so many of us in this yeah. country. And it and as you said, it just never works. It doesn't it never works. Mm -hmm. It's always a lie, but you can yeah. believe it for so long, you know, yeah. and I think that's one of the like insidious um just one of the insidious consequences of white supremacy is the way that it has like twisted the narrative um so that it is possible to believe that the reason that black people suffer is because they deserve their suffering, um, which is so, it's mind boggling. Um, and yet that's that's where we are. And it takes some people um, a long time to kind of break that narrative that I don't deserve what's happening to me. This is illogical. I can't right. approach it with logic. Right, yeah. exactly. And it and it contributes to this, um, to this distinction between black people in their own community too. Like right. this, once you've internalized it, the need to separate yourself from people who aren't performing at that level, who are gonna exactly. make that it's, yeah, as you said, it's insidious. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I'm I'm curious, I want, I don't wanna belabor the point of the distinctions between the books, because I know you talk about that a lot in your interviews, I would imagine at least. Yeah. Um, but I have, I'm personally curious, do you have a preference? Like, did you enjoy mm -hmm. writing one more than the other? If you were to write, if you haven't already started a third and you and you were gonna choose between those two approaches, is there one that you would mm -hmm. prioritize? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I would say that Transcendent Kingdom was easier to do a first draft of um, because there was just, there was far less research to do. It felt kind of freer and looser um, I mostly the research aspect. I just wasn't spending years of my life uh, researching this book. Um, yeah. So the first draft came like faster and freer. It was harder to edit than Homegoing. I felt like once I had a first draft of Homegoing, I could see it so clearly that I understood what needed to change. And also um, because the chapters were so discreet, um, if I changed something in one chapter, it didn't have these ripple effects to all of the other chapters. Um, whereas Transcendent Kingdom felt like a game of Jenga when I was when I was um, uh, revising it. I just knew that if I like pulled this one thing out, the whole thing could fall, and um, yeah. and so the pressures of that felt uh, felt challenging. But I think what I learned through writing a book that was so different from the first book is um, that you're really just you're just trying to tell the story as it wants to be told, like whatever tools you have at your disposal to do so um you should use like it's not um you don't have to write the same book twice you can just follow your curiosities and whatever direction the st story wants to take you you should you should go there um and that was really nice it felt like um it felt like stretching a new muscle and i, I really enjoyed that i bet that's yeah. awesome mm -hmm. and um well i you mentioned that it was harder to edit I am curious about that. The structure is, it works so well for that book. Mm -hmm. um, 
because you can imagine with a character like Gifty that she would be chronically uh, burdened by these memories mm -hmm. and they keep coming back in in the narrative. Um, how did you how did you decide on the structure? We we go between the past with Gifty's childhood and then also her um, her adolescence in these predominantly white educational experiences, and then we have the present where she's with um, where she's trying to nurse her mother back to health. Mm -hmm. At this point, did you decide on exactly how to interlay the scenes, um, mm. particularly the letters too? How did you decide mm. on it? Did you write it discreetly and then blend it, or did you write it as it appears? Mm. I wrote it mostly as it appears, um, and it took me a really wow. long time to to wrap my head around how to think about structure for this book. And ultimately, yeah. what I landed on was there's a line. I also should mention, like, I don't, I don't pre-plan at all really. So uh, I don't have like an outline or character sketches or anything. So I really do feel like I'm just kind of crawling my way through the beginning to try to figure out what I want the book to look like. And so early on, there's a line where Gifty says something like, um, she's talking about her family and she says, there used to be four of us, then three, then two. If my mother goes, whether by choice or not, there will only be one. Um, and I used that as like a, a guiding, um, as a guiding force for thinking about structure. Um, so if you, if you see in the novel, there are these, the novel has this kind of simple pr present story. Gifty is working on her PhD when she gets a call um, that her mother has fallen into another depression um, and she brings her mother to come stay with her. And then um, really, it's it's very simple. Like her mother spends most of her time in bed. Um, not much is happening in the present story. So it's a story that's like driven a lot by these flashbacks. And the flashbacks go in this kind of like spiral order where it starts with the four and then the three and then two. Mm. Um, and so in the four, when it's the full family, you're getting a lot of the journal entries, um, which okay. Gifty wrote when she was a child. Same for the three as well. But um, but then you start to get fewer and fewer as Gifty becomes disillusioned um, with keeping this journal to God. Um, when you're in the present story, you're getting a lot of the kind of research that, that Gifty does. You're getting a lot of these um, uh, other um, uh, studies and things that she's interested in. Um, so that's a way to kind of add another layer. Um, but it was mostly just kind of toggling back from the present into these moments of of kind of diminishing family. Okay, yeah. and how did you know what aspects of her past to include? Did you see the scenes or did you think I have to show this so that this will make sense? It was more that I saw the scenes. I just, um, yeah, I, I just kind of knew which moments I wanted to touch on. Um, I wasn't thinking about it kind of in a prescriptive way. It just felt like anything that, anything that approached um, Nana, anything that approached her brother's uh, passing, I wanted to include. Okay. Um, so that's okay. how I thought of it. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So I've read that some elements of your own life are present in this book. I, the only ones I know of are the religion and the hometown. Yeah. And, um, so I'm interested in that because I have been forbidden from writing about anything that's based on my own life just because I can't <laughs> do it time. You know, I've started books that have never, I've started and finished books that have never been published because I tried mm -hmm. to do it on my own life and I lost the voice. You know how you mm -hmm. lose, it got blended. Like I wasn't sure yeah. which. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, how did you do that? If it was a character mm -hmm. who had elements of yourself in yeah. her, how did you not get confused? Oh yeah, that's a good question. I guess I, I mean, I hadn't done that before really. Homegoing, I think, is about me and in some ways a kind of like a macro pulled back way my interest in exploring diaspora my interest in thinking through Ghanaian and american identity like those things um this um, i was working with a specific aspect of my life which is that i did grow up pentecostal um, and i did grow up attending a predominantly white pentecostal church um and it's a it's a it's kind of a to use Gifty's words, it's kind of like a wound in my life that I keep going back to, that I keep trying to address um, because I had a, such a difficult experience in that church. Um, and so it's a thing that I'm always like trying to approach in my writing. Religion is a thing that I'm often approaching in my writing. 
Um, but this was the most kind of directly influenced by that time in my life. Um, in terms of how I kept it separate, I think, I don't know, for me, what it feels like is like, if the book is about you or like a reflection of you, it's a reflection in a fun house mirror, you know, it just doesn't, by the, by the end of it, it doesn't look like you at all. Yeah. Um, and I think, I'm not sure how that happens for me other than I put in like the tiniest seed um, and then I kind of like push the character to grow on her own and I follow her wherever she is going. Um, and there are so many differences from the outset, you know, she's incredibly um, logical in a way that I am not. Um, she also grew up with a family that was really walled off and guarded and kind of isolated themselves from Ghanaian community, um, black community in a way that um, is not true of my family. Um, so there were these pieces that kind of inserted themselves early on in a way that allowed me to see her as distinct from myself. Um, yeah, and I think that's 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 what I relied on to to keep me from um, from making it about me. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Huh? Mm. And, um, and okay. So I've also read that your friend, you have a dear friend who's a scientist and she helped with the research yeah. with the scientific components. Okay. Which made sense to me. Obviously you have done extensive research on those aspects. Um, what was more interesting though, was it, you, you seem to have, you've accessed the tone of a scientist, like, mm tone of a scientist like um gifty comes off as so guarded she's giving us all the information that we need i mean she's sharing but it's like it feels so structured in the way she's relaying it and um yeah she just feels more closed off more structured more guarded and and th and that that inhabits the tone of the book and mm -hmm. so how, how did you slip into that tone because i would imagine you know you're a writer you're not a scientist yeah how you, I, I see how you got the information. How did you get the, the tone? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that, well, I was thinking about Gifty's guardedness as a kind of um, defense mechanism that she has. So um, her guardedness, it appears most readily in moments when um, friends or lovers are trying to get her to talk about um, her grief, to talk about her brother. Um, those are the points where she like puts up this wall um, and this wall is so strong that she can't even talk about the reasons that she's doing this research. She says things like, I wanted to do the hardest thing and this seemed like the hardest thing. Um, and then as you read, you realize, well, no, also your brother passed away and you're trying to figure out um, what it was that led him back to addiction time and again. Um, and so I think, having a character who who kind of wants to hide even from me as the writer um, made something made made it so that like in order to get to her I had to kind of think differently than I'm used to thinking um, and I think that's where the the kind of um, methodical voice comes from but there's also I think the influence of just reading a lot of scientific papers, which is not a medium that I usually <laughs> read. Um, and the the tone of those papers um, obviously are very direct, like not attempting to kind of give you flowery language or um, <laughs> embellish. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think having read now many, many of those in order to write the book, um, some of that seeped in too, because Gifty, when we meet her, is trying to write one of these papers herself. Um, so it felt like it made sense that she would be thinking in a certain kind of, um, in a certain kind of tone. Okay. And do you still have that voice? Did that voice stay with you once the book was done? The methodical mm -hmm. voice? Oh, I've got one of these methodical voices. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I suppose I do. I don't, it'll be interesting to see, like, once I get my way into a third book, like, what yeah. what, what comes out, because um, I'm sure yeah. some of it is still there. Um, I think you probably take a piece of every every book with you, but... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely have felt that, like, a voice, a character that I wrote about, their voice, I'm mm. able to access it, in, you know, internally sometimes, even after the book is done, which yeah. is nice. Right? Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, now one of the 
one of the most beautiful parts of the book for me, but also the most painful was, you know, your portrayal of mental illness and addiction. Oh my gosh. I feel like you, I, I haven't read many books where I just had to put it down and just, I had to just like go back to it a mm. few hours later because it felt like your rendering of the pain made it feel like I was in the house with these people. I felt mm. like I was living with them yeah. and I was, I was also on the edge waiting for their potential deterioration. It really did. I mean, I really did like that authentic and so close and intimate and um, just thorough. I feel like you just really swept into that house and you really captured all of the emotion inside it. Um, so that was beautiful and so painful. How did you do that? Was that research? How, how did you call upon that, you know, the information and the emotion of it? Mm. It was research. And I think um, one thing that really helped, helped is the wrong word because it's, it's tackling this like really difficult subject. But um, around the time that I started writing this book, there were a lot of really excellent um, essays and articles and documentaries and um, all kinds of things coming out around the opioid epidemic. Um, um, and a lot of the, a lot of them were portrayals that I had never really seen before of people who were suffering from opioid use disorder. There were there was this documentary I watched of um, first responders, like firefighters who were being trained on how to deal with um, overdose situations. Um, mm -hmm. That was fascinating. There was a great um, kind of visual article in the New York Times, um, maybe in 2017, um, called How, how Opioids Hijack Your Brain. Um, that was also kind of looking at, at this issue from many different perspectives. Um, yeah. One thing that I noticed is that a lot of the reporting about this um, had had become so like humanizing in a way. It was a lot more focused on the family. There were a lot of reports about um, the kids who were kind of dealing with parents who were suffering from opioid use disorder, how they were managing to kind of continue on. Um, it felt so much more nuanced and so much more careful and um compassionate um, mm -hmm. than a lot of the reporting that I had seen before. And of course, I knew that this was in great part because um, the people who are suffering from this op op opioid epidemic right now are primarily white. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an epidemic that is focused on uh, white people who are in the suburban and rural areas. Um, yeah. So now suddenly there's more of a shift toward um, healthcare rather than criminalization um, mm. and um, more of an understanding of the implications of forces beyond your control in your addiction. Right. Like the attention paid to the pharmaceutical companies is so different than how we talked about the crack epidemic um, or the heroin epidemic of the, of the 60s either, uh, which were primarily in cities and affecting black people. Um, and so I, it was like this bittersweet thing where I was like, oh, it's it's so nice that we're that we're starting finally to look at the full lives of people who are suffering from addiction um, and to, to kind of understand that they are um, people who are worthy of our compassion without that this the judgment that is often right. attached to this. Um, right. But it seemed to me like it was coming at this cost um, of leaving Black people out of that narrative. Um, and so one thing that I wanted to do with this book was to, um, to, to not leave Black people behind, to show that you know, we also deserve the same kind of attention and care um, and understanding. Um, and, um, and so that's, that's kind of where I was coming from, from a research perspective, like trying to kind of apply all of that same um, nuanced, uh, sensitive reporting that I was reading to the life of, um, of these characters. That's interesting. I didn't even think about that. I yeah. didn't even, think about that. so, and it's interesting because once the, once this, the opioid addiction affected a black family in this book, at least the judgment came with it, you mm -hmm. know, like the judgment of the church and, uh, and it, you know, and the judgment of the, the coaches, et cetera, it, it's, it's obviously something that follows race and not the drug because yeah. it, it followed him in this book. Um, even though right. it was a different drug, it wasn't crack, it wasn't heroin. That's right. really interesting. Yeah. I had thought about, 
I, I mean, I obviously know about the opioid crack discrepancy, but I hadn't thought about you playing with that in this book. Yeah, yeah. Really, really cool. Wow. Yeah. Um, another one of one of the most interesting lines I thought was that uh, that, that that schizophrenics in India and Ghana hear kinder voices. Mm. I didn't know that. So, yeah. okay, so there's that piece, mm -hmm. and then there's um, there's this the beautiful scene, but the heartbreaking scene where Gifty's mom is wailing about, um, you know, I should have, I should have let Nana go back with his dad. Right. And then the scene she's in Ghana and her mother's sister is there and we see her mother's sister is really joyful and stable and, and we get the sense that this is who the mother, Gifty even says, this is who my mother could have been. Yeah. Um, so there are these, there, there's, there, in, in these respects, it, it feels like there's a commentary being made on the impact of immigration, especially mm -hmm. um, immigration to such a saturated, just to such a white community, you know. Um, yeah. what, what would you say, what is your commentary on that experience? Yeah, um, I was interested in the ways that, that culture interplays with, um, with mental health and the stigmatization of mental health. So that study that you mentioned is a real study um, that I talk right. about in the book, but it's real. It came out in 2015 um, and researchers looked at schizophrenics in Ghana, India, and, uh, and the US in San Mateo, California. Um, and what they found was that the um, schizophrenics in Ghana and India heard voices that were far more benevolent, um, kinder. They were the voices, they recognized the voices as the voices of their family members or um, just like loved ones or of the voice of God. Um, yeah. And then in California, um, the, the schizophrenics described their experiences as being really harsh, violent, intrusive. Um, they felt like they were being bombarded by the, the voices. They didn't recognize the voices as anyone. Um, and and I, I thought about that a lot and the way in which culture and cultural like um, expectations and understandings um, change the way that we think about mental health. Um, so for these um, people who were living in places um, that didn't have the same kind of emphasis on um, mental health being like necessarily something that you need to medicate or, you know, send, um, send somebody to the doctor. It's like something that you handle with the family. Um, mm -hmm. It made sense that there was like a different relationship to the illness. Um, even, I don't even know if they would call it illness necessarily. Um, and that I found really fascinating. Um, so there were moments in this novel, I think, where I'm, I'm trying to kind of tease out um, what might have been if they, if the family had stayed in Ghana, what their relationship yeah. to these things might have been. There's yeah. a, a, a point where Gifty's mother, um, who has suffered um, from this debilitating depression, says to her daughter, I don't believe, I don't believe in, in mental illness. Like, I think that this is a Western invention. Um, and and obviously we are left thinking what, like you haven't been able to get out of bed, how can you not believe? But for her, it's this thing that she gives to, to God. It's just like another thing in her life that she can share with the Lord. It doesn't feel, um, it doesn't feel like this thing that she needs to pathologize or wants to pathologize. Um, Gifty doesn't think of it that way. Um, and who's right? I think that's the other thing that Gifty is trying to kind of tease out in this throughout this book is that, um, however, however, whatever gets you through, however you deal with your pain, whatever you need, um, is it's not my job to like say what's right. Um, and I, I found that to be an interesting kind of way to think about the the problems of this novel. Yeah, it is interesting. And and so for for the religion aspect, we see Gifty in the beginning, obviously deeply rooted in her faith. She's writing letters to God. Um, she takes it very seriously and literally. Mm. And then as the book goes on, um, as she gets older, her faith declines, as she gets more exposed to science, as she gets more exposed to the US, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and her mother though, that faith is always there. And there's this interesting scene at the end where one of my favorite scenes where Gifty's bathing her mother and mm. it's, it, it, 
uh, on the surface, it seems like it's a very humbling scene for the mother. And mm -hmm. then she like shoots up with this power at one point and she's like, she says something, I think she says, do not be afraid, God is with me wherever I go. Mm -hmm. And you feel her power there. Yeah. And it's interesting because that power reminds me of the power that I saw in Gifty as a child in the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like as she lost, and this is not a commentary on religion, I'm just talking about the characters. Yeah. But I feel like as she lost that faith, she did lose some of that power. Mm -hmm. And I wondered like what, what a balance for her would be in terms of her power mm. as, as it relates to spectrum religion. Like we get a hint of it in the last chapter, I think. I think I have an idea of what you right. think that would be, but like, yeah, what would a balance for her look like as it regards religion in terms of her in terms of her acceptance of her power and her step her mm. stepping into power, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 I think that the power of the religion, particularly for the for Gifty's mom is um, is that she doesn't feel like she has to carry her own burdens. Mm. Um, and Gifty yeah. is a character who is very, very clearly carrying all of her burdens and everybody else's too. Um, and she has all of these questions. She doesn't really, she doesn't really ever kind of take care of herself. You never see her in these moments of like, um, of ease of kind of giving away some of the the stress that is on her shoulders the weight that is on her shoulders yeah. um and i think that that is the role that that the church that god used to play for her it was this opportunity to um as her mother would say like take her problems to god tell god what she wanted and let him and let him take over um mm -hmm. and so when she when she stops believing when she can like no longer reconcile her faith to her um, to her kind of logical mind and her her brother's death and all of these things that have allowed her faith to crumble when she stops believing she also loses that um, just that that place where she can lay her burdens down um, mm -hmm. so I think ultimately in the end after you know this entire book spent asking all of these transcendent questions asking all of these difficult unsolvable questions um, Gifty comes to a place where she recognizes that what she needs um, is still that sense of like ease. Um, and so we see her finally, I think, um, in the end, I don't know if I would call it like a hopeful moment. Uh, maybe it is hopeful, but it's something um, it's something like a relief, like suddenly she is laying her burdens down or she is like accepting the fact that there are things that she cannot control. Um, and she's a woman who I think is deeply invested in, in control. Um, yeah. And so suddenly she's like, I, this is out of my hands. Some of these things are out of my hands and that's okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Wow. Did you, did you read anything in particular to prepare for writing this or mm -hmm. while you were writing it? Um, I did read some things. I read, um, well, I reread Gilead um, okay. by Marilyn Robinson, which is um, a beautiful book and also just kind of the classic, um, a classic um, book that deals with religion um, and, and the faithful character uh, that does so, I think, with, with again, just great nuance and sensitivity. Um, one of my favorite books, um, in the world is Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin. Um, mm -hmm. And that was another book that I read to kind of think through how to write about grappling with, with one's faith, um, as that does it excellently. Mm -hmm. And on the religion front, again, there's another um, writer, a Canadian writer named Miriam Taves, um, oh. who writes about um, Mennonites, uh, the Mennonite community of Canada. Um, and and she's another writer who I really think um, gets it right or does does something that I really appreciate um, in talking about religion and religious communities. Um, so she was another person that I was reading for okay. for that kind of research. Okay, that makes sense. Well, I don't want to monopolize the questions. I know we have some that have come in. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna look through them. Okay. Um, oh, this is interesting. Okay. Yeah, I just love your voice and writing style. Thank you for being here tonight. Transcendent Kingdom is wonderful, absolutely. I'm enjoying reading it. It touches on so many different themes, religion, addiction, mental health, and the plight of immigrants in the American South. What did you learn about yourself in writing this book? 
Mm. What did I learn about myself in writing this book? Um, well, I think maybe the biggest thing that I learned is that after after Homegoing came out, um, I did have this period where I felt kind of bereft, you know, like you work on these novels for so long and you live with these characters for so long and then you're just kind of like, wait, what now, you know? Um, and I'm not the kind of writer who's like always working on things back to back or like concurrently. So I really, I didn't have anything. It was like, what do yeah. I do now? Um, and it and it was a, a strange feeling for me as somebody who has um, really since childhood um, built my identity around the fact that I write, uh, that this is like the way that I process my my thoughts. This is the way that I engage with the world. And I had, and I had, just this feeling of like loss, like I missed this book that I had spent so much time with. Um, and then suddenly also I was doing all of this um, travel, these events, I was very public facing in a way that I had never been before. Um, mm -hmm. And I just kept thinking, how do I, how do I get back to the quiet place? Like, what does that look like now that I am a published author? Like, what does it mean to like return to that quiet place in my mind that lets me do this. And for a while I thought maybe I, I, maybe I don't know how to get there. So I think the thing that I learned with writing this book is that I can get there um, and that, um, that I do have the kind of, um, it is within my power to like figure out how to start a new book, um, how to kind of quiet all of the noise around, um, around me that makes it difficult to write. It is within my power to kind of return to the place that allows me to to write um that place is always there with me um and that that was that was a really both a nice feeling and a relief that's amazing and how long did it take for you to get back there and did you do anything mm -hmm. specific it took probably um like several months like i think well homegoing came out in 2016 i probably started working on this like actively actively in 2017 um so it took it took several months like maybe six yeah. months um okay. and i think a few things helped one was um just learning to say no <laughs> learning to say no when i was overextended when i you know was tired um and then the other thing that really helped is that i accepted a fellowship i had never done writing fellowships before um oh but I did two fellowships, one at U-Cross in Wyoming, which is um, a town that has a population of 25. Um, okay. And so it like doubles with the with these writers and artists and dancers <laughs> who, come, uh, who come stay on these ranches to work. Yeah. So I did that. Um, uh -huh. And then I did another fellowship at the American Academy in Berlin. Um, and I moved to Berlin for a year to do that. No way. Um, yeah, which was really, really no cool. Yeah, wow. yeah, it was awesome. Um, and I, yeah, I became kind of a convert. Like I, I get, I get why some people don't like it, but um, what I liked about it was that both of these fellowships, I think, really prioritized making sure that you had nothing else to think about but your work. Okay. Um, and so. Um, and so it just felt like such a luxury to wake up every day and go sit in my like dedicated office space and and write and like not have to think about anything else. Um, that's, so that was one of the ways. That's wonderful. I, I think that's wonderful. And did you always know that like in the back of your mind, did you know that the next book might be about this topic or were there other options floating around? Mm, no, I, I think I mm, that's a good question. No, I think I knew that that the next book was going to be about something like this. Um, okay. Not the not the neuroscience piece. Um, okay. But there was there was the mother daughter thing was already there somewhere in my mind. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, but I know. What you mean, I'm going to go back to some of these questions we have more now. But I I want to say I know exactly what you mean about. I've actually I don't let myself not have I have a list going of other mm -hmm. to write about next because I get depressed. Yeah. If I'm not on something it's funny it's like a scramble to the finish line when you're working yep. on it you really want to be done but then when you're done you're like wait what yeah. am I now? it's, it's you such get, a sad feeling when you're done it's such a sad feeling i hate that feeling yeah oh my gosh yeah, yeah. okay um let's see okay someone wants to know how have you celebrated they, there's a bunch of praise here mm. you know everyone loves you i'm not gonna read all the praise um <laughs> 
how have you celebrated when each of your books has been published? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, well, homegoing was really nice because we weren't in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, and I was living in I was living in Berkeley at the time. Um, and I remember my my whole family came. So my brothers and my parents and um, and we just kind of went out and okay. had dinner together. And I don't know, it was just a it was kind of a family affair. And um, I felt like really just surrounded by by love and by people who had been rooting for me to to have this in my life for for a long time um so that was like a clear celebration um for this what did i do to celebrate transcendent kingdom i bought some champagne i bought some i bought dessert <laughs> i bought myself a cake um yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um yeah oh and then i had was lobster it? rolls <laughs> oh that's that's wonderful. That's it was a great fancy. idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's right. <laughs> um, did you feel like for you, was it like, um, did you have people in your life who thought you should do something more structured or was everyone always rooting for you to be a writer? No, my parents definitely were like, you should be a doctor. Um, okay. That's what, that's what we came here for. Like we okay. have invested in you. You are going to do a career that, uh, that gives you some security so that you can turn around and invest in us. Like that's yeah. the kind of parents that I had. Yes. Um, and it really took, it took a long time to, to bring them around to the fact that a, that I was just kind of unsuited to anything else but writing. Like this is the only thing that I ever wanted to do and everything else, like nothing else um, stoked my passion in this way. Um, and so I felt like anything else that I tried, I would just be a, a worse version of myself. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think really once they realized um, just how like happy this made me, um, and also that I was willing to kind of apply the same amount of um, dedication and drive to this as I would to anything else that they might have wanted me to do. Um, I think they like slowly started to wrap their, their heads around it. The other thing I would say too is that I have a childhood friend who's a visual artist who's Nigerian American um, and she became successful um, while I was still like in, in grad school. Um, oh. or in, in college. And I think that was really kind of the, the tipping point for my parents too, is they were like, oh, you can make a life out of art. It might not look like the life that we understand, but um, yeah. but here's this this woman that we know who's doing it. Um, so That's I think that was, that was helpful. Yeah. Are they so proud? They're, they're just so proud. <laughs> oh, I bet they are. Yeah. They are, okay. Um, let's see, I'm just looking at the questions. Um, so this is for both of us. I'll ask you first, what is your writing, what has your writing, reading life been like during the pandemic and Black Lives mm. Matter? Is it hard to find that place that y'all just mentioned, the quiet place? Mm, yes, for me, it's a definite, yes, it's been hard to find, to find that quiet place. At the beginning of the pandemic, I was actually reading a lot. Like I wasn't having, I wasn't trying to write, I should also say, like I was giving myself a, a little break um, yeah. from having to, to think about writing as I started to um, approach this publication. So I wasn't writing, um, I was reading a ton, um, but then as the, as the uprisings began, um, I just found it really hard to concentrate. I'm not, I'm not on social media, but I was like, I, I was toggling between different like Twitter accounts, like trying to get the latest updates. Yeah. I was on the news all the time. Like I just felt, so much anxious energy that I couldn't I couldn't focus for um, for even like ten minutes to read a book um, yeah. and and I think I just ultimately kind of like again like accepted that this was this was what I needed to do at this point to to feel um, to feel okay um, and so I, I stopped putting any pressure on myself to be thinking about reading and writing in in this period um, and I think that that's ultimately helped um, I don't know when I'm gonna feel gonna feel that like place that mental place again where I feel like okay I can I can start working again um, yeah. but I, I'm story. not trying to force the issue during a pandemic I think right and I think you're touring and your book just yeah. I think it's harder for me it's harder to write when you're touring when I'm touring and when that whole process is approaching yeah even. 
that's that feels impossible because it's so much energy, especially if you're so an introvert. Much. Which I am, yeah, yeah. and it's like you only have a certain amount of energy. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, but um, I'll just answer the question really quickly. I haven't, mm -hmm. um, I haven't, I I wasn't able to read in the beginning because mm -hmm. the I wasn't able to focus, and I, but you know, all the reasons you just named. Mm -hmm. um, the writing helped me. I, I'm mm -hmm. always able to write, and it calms me down. It I get depressed if I'm not working on something, as I said. Yeah. Before, really, yeah. I, it's really not good for me not to be working on something. So, right. it's actually, keeping me like in a, um, it's almost like it's my center, and um, so whatever's going on around doesn't affect me as much because I have this core that I can yeah. resort to. Um, well, let's see. If new that relatively young readers, say juniors and seniors in high school. Were reading your novels, what would you hope that they would gain from the experience of encountering your characters and their stories? And mm. oh, this question is from my high school teacher, by the way, my high school English teacher. Aww. I'm curious about your sense of audience when you write. That's a great question. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Um, yeah, I think with both of the books, though, um, though Transcendent Kingdom is working on a more intimate scale, I think I'm still concerned with in both of the books and a thing that I, I think would be helpful for young people to think about um, is the fact that that the present um, isn't this kind of discrete thing that exists outside of time, that we are all a part of history, um, that history isn't something that happens and then goes away and has nothing, uh, has no bearing on who we are now, um, that we take every moment with us. Um, and I think that's that's true in homegoing, very keenly yeah. true in homegoing. Um, yeah. But it's also true in Transcendent Kingdom too. Like some of the some of the trauma that that Gifty is dealing with is not hers; it's her mother's, oh. um, and and she takes that with her. Um, and so to recognize that we are that we are a part of time, not outside of it, um, I think is something that is important for young people to see. Um, that the choices that we are making impact everything that comes after us. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. And then what was the second part of the question? Um, well, I think it's I think it's just a follow up, but you could speak to it too. I'm curious about your sense of audience when you write. Oh, right, yeah, my sense of audience. Um, you know, I think I've said this before and I, and I believe it all the more, uh, the more I write. Um, is I love that Toni Morrison quote, and I'm not going to get it quite right, so I'm going to paraphrase, but um, she said, uh, if you are looking on your bookshelf for a book that you want to read and you cannot find it, you must write it. Uh, and I read that probably really early on in my writing life, like in college or something. Um, but it it speaks to who my audience is so, so clearly for me. Like I, I loved books so much when I was young um, and I read so much when I was young, but I wasn't finding literature that felt like it was speaking to me directly. Um, and so when I write, I am writing for that person who loved to read, um, who was seeking these kind of moments of recognition um, and not finding it. So I, I want any anyone, um, who was a, a young ya kind of person to pick up my books and and find themselves. Yeah. Well, I I feel like especially with um, with both of them and especially with Transcendent Kingdom, I feel like that book will be such a um, a solace for any young person who's struggling with any kind of mm. family issues or mental health issues yeah. to see like a path forward. You yeah. know. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's lovely. Okay. Um, writing is a way to take action. However, some people may not see it that way. Mm. How would you explain the activism behind writing fiction? Hmm. Yeah, I do. I do think that writing is a way to take action. It's a way to kind of um, like some of the best writing that that we read. I think is writing that allows us to figure out, to understand, and contextualize the things that we are experiencing in the world. And that feels like like necessary action to me um, because sometimes you don't really have the language for um, you don't have like a name to attach to the feeling. Um, yeah. and, and writers are are suited to to 
figuring that kind of thing out. Um, but I do also think that that writing is like a slow activism. Like it's not um, it's not really immediate. Um, very rarely do you have uh, these days. Very rarely do you have books like um, Upton Sinclair's *The Jungle* that like changes policy, or um, *Silent Spring*, um, which changes policy. Um, so I think when you are writing, what you're doing is you're kind of building um, you're building a path forward. Um, you're allowing this kind of slow burn um, that hopefully becomes embedded in the people who are reading your work. Um, so that they take that, um, they take what they are reading with them. Um, but at the same time, like I always say, like characters and novels are not real people, and, um, and and novels are no substitute for real life. So if you are reading something that moves you, that makes you think about something differently, um, you should be applying it to your real life. You should be figuring out what does this mean. I have to do um, to change. Um, to change the way that I behave. Like it shouldn't just be, I read this this book that made me sad about racism and now I'm gonna continue to right. you know, work this job that, that doesn't hire black people. Right. Um, it, should, it should have an impact on your life in a kind of lived way. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, I remember um, when my first book came out, one of the characters is, um, He's a young black man who's in and out of jail on marijuana charges. And my father-in-law is a, you know, 68 year old white man who's a radiologist. Mm -hmm. And he told me that, that was the character he most identified with. Oh, wow. And I feel like a lot of people said that a lot of people really like they identified with that character because they can feel the humanness of it. And I think yes. hopefully, you know, when they go out and they see someone like that on the street, they, mm -hmm. they won't, they, they'll, factor that humanness into their perception and into their treatment of that person. You know, that's the hope at least. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think if it happens, if they read more and more books like that, you know, it can become more of a way of thinking as opposed to like one particular contradiction that may or may not, right. um, you know, uh, uh, be absorbed. Right. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, this is interesting. Um, Okay, yeah, I literally consumed Transcendent Kingdom. I just started reading it again this evening because I feel like I needed to read, process, and then reread. That's true. I felt the same way. Wow. With that in mind, I'm going to be exploring Gifty's trauma and healing during the second reread. You mentioned that maybe the ending was a little hopeful. Do you feel like Gifty's realization that she can't control everything contributes to a hopeful healing for Gifty's character? I do, I do. I think, um, again, that Gifty, because of all the chaos of her childhood, has been really um, driven toward order, like driven toward control. She wants to kind of um, be able to kind of impose, impose some kind of structure to the story of her life. Um, and that that imposition causes her a lot of pain, though she can't see it. She can't see um, she can't see herself in so many ways throughout this novel um, that I feel like the ending is this point where suddenly she has given up control and and she can only kind of move forward from there. So it does feel hopeful to me um, that she's finally like allowed herself to live within um, to live within this knowledge that there are so many things that she's not going to get answers for um, yeah. and and that that is okay. Yeah, um, that makes sense. And I'm just gonna do a few more. Um, okay. Um, how much revision did you do on this book? I was curious about that too. And the time span, like when, well, you said you started in 2017. Yeah, I started okay. in, yeah. So, so they were, about, how much revision did you do? And how did you know when it was finished and no more revision was needed? I think that's the universal question. Yeah, that's always a question. Like, I, I'm sure I, if I read it again today, I would have something that I felt like I could tweak. Um, yeah. Do you reread the books when you're <laughs> in the published? Do you read them? I haven't. Um, I read it when I got the uh, the galley, which was oh, probably like in January. Yeah, okay. so I haven't read it since January. Okay, um, but not, not too long ago. Read it in January. 
Um, you know, there was, it, I felt good. I felt really proud of it. Um, right. I felt like it had done what I wanted it to do. There were certainly like some moments where I was like, oh, I might have made that sentence different. But, um, but yeah, I felt mostly just, just proud. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. Um, so you trust yourself to reread the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I had to like remember it so I could talk about it. <laughs> um, but this book took, I would say, about like two years to to complete. Um, and the, as I said earlier, the the first draft was really kind of, um, it felt like it came to me fully formed, like it was an easier draft to get through. Um, and I always, I have, I'm really lucky. I have um, this really good friend named Christina who I've known since I was in college, since I was 18 and she's read everything that I've written since I was 18. Um, and so I often will send her the first draft of something and, um, and then she gave me feedback for that. Um, I also shared it with two other readers that's usually how I go about it. So I'll, I'll finish a draft, I'll send it to a reader, um, get their notes, and that's how I start going about the other drafts. This book I did, I would say, um, I did three drafts on my own, and then I sent it to my agent. I did, I wouldn't call it a draft with him. I did, I changed like two things um, from his notes um, before sending it to my editor. Um, and then I did one draft with my editor. Okay. Um, yeah. And okay. the, the draft with my editor was the hardest one. Um, and it mostly involved kind of rethinking timeline. Um, so before it was a lot more, there was a lot more shifting back and forth. Um, and this, oh. this draft is more kind of like, um, the, the flashbacks are more consolidated, yeah. not completely consolidated, but not as um, back and forth as the previous draft. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And you're, the people you send it to, like Christina, for instance, is she a writer or? No, she's a lawyer. <laughs> um, yeah, but she's yeah. like one of, the, one of the people that I trust most in the world, like taste wise, like, She's okay. never let me down when she recommends a book or a movie okay. or a song. Like oh, I just yes. feel like she gets what I like. So yeah. that if I am pleasing her, then I know that I would be pleasing myself. Yes. Um, yeah. And she's a big reader. Yeah, she's a big reader. Huge okay. reader. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um let's see. Uh what are you reading right now? Ah, uh, right now I'm reading Luster by Raven Leilani. Um That's it's so good. I'm only on the second chapter, but I really, really love it. I like it a lot too. I mean, I've just never read anything like it. I've never yeah. read anything like it. It's same, same. Yeah. Like from that first sentence, you're just like, whoa, I'm in. <laughs> I know. It has to be a show, right? Don't you feel like yeah. it needs to be a show? Yeah, it would be a really good show. I'm thinking it, it I also read um earlier this year, I read Queenie um, by oh, Candace yeah. Williams. I feel it's like they're They've got some. They've got some conversation going, but especially the office scenes, like these two black women in predominantly white spaces, offices, yeah. like trying to yeah. navigate that. Like I feel like there's there's some there's some link there, but it's I really like, good. It is, and I love her. I love her. Um, well, I don't know. Have you seen this already? Her relationship with the other black woman at the office. Yes, isn't that yeah. hilarious? Yeah, it's really really good, and just like the uh, the observations are so spot on yes yeah. brilliant like so profound and hilarious and yeah. just also so well written because i feel like with that kind of um with that kind of book sometimes it, it doesn't necessarily like the sentences aren't necessarily going to be beautiful it's more about yeah. how funny it is or how yeah. sarcastic and keen but like she's an amazing writer yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah. she's got it yeah well um i think I think unless, um, well, unless you want to say what you're working on next, I feel oh. like it's a good, <laughs> what you don't have to do. And instead we can end by talking about how you, um, how you keep yourself off of social media. We can, <laughs> which one of those? Okay. Let's do the social media question. Cause I'm too superstitious for the, 
<laughs> for the um, what am I working on question. Um, but I, I used to have social media. I used to have a Twitter account that my that my bosses made me get when I was working at yeah. a startup. Um, and so as soon as I quit the startup, I got off that because I just never really liked Twitter that much. Yeah. Um, but then I had a Facebook account and an Instagram account for a long time. Um, but what I came to realize was that I was just it was just like keeping me at such a heightened state. Like I was just always like so attuned to um, everything that was going on that felt like everybody's like the glamour of everybody's lives or even just like the the pits of everybody's lives. And, um, and it just, I started to feel like I wasn't like living a real like embodied life. I just yeah. felt like I, it felt fake. Yeah. Um, and um, that paired with my grievances against the Facebook corporation in general yeah. made me realize that this, this just wasn't the place that I wanted to be spending my time. So yeah. I decided to exit. Um, and and it's, been, it's been good. Sometimes I, like, I miss the, like, the scroll with seeing like, what your friends are up to. It's much harder um, to like, make sure that you're keeping up in a substantive way with, with people who don't live near you. Um, That's but, true. Um, but I think, I think overall, like my mental health is a lot better. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, I think it's amazing. The reason I bring it up is I think it's amazing because there's, you know, people will say as a writer, you need to be so prominent on social media. And I love that you've had so much success without it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like work as opposed to the personality you've manufactured for right. social media. And I, I love that. And yeah, I think I mean, you're another person like that who yeah. it's work that speaks for itself. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I was fortunate in that I didn't like nobody on my team like pressed me to do this too, yeah. which I know happens to writers sometimes where yeah. they're told that they have to kind of create yeah. a platform and um, everyone was like, you can do what you want. So, so That's I decided to, to take that. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. thank you so much. It has been so nice to talk oh, to you. You too. Thank you, Margaret. This is so kind and generous of you. Oh, I I had a ball. I had a ball reading it. I had a ball talking about it. So, I guess. <laughs> You're muted. Oh, he's figuring it out. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll get through these awkward book things, right? Yeah. On, on um, social, on, yeah, etc. Et et Can you hear me now? <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry about that. Thanks um, no, no. to you both for an amazing conversation. And uh, thanks to everyone in the chat who hung in with us through the various uh, technical stuff. Um, we will be um, re repackaging this and it should immediately be available right here at this URL to rewatch and hopefully rewatch seamlessly. Um, but I'll also be repackaging it with um, captions and putting it on YouTube in a few days. So oh, keep an eye out for that as well. Um, but, you know, we just hope that folks will click this teal button, buy Transcendent Kingdom, buy the new paperback of The Revisioners. Um, they're both really important books. Also, uh, buy, you know, Homegoing and A Different Kind of Freedom, amazing books um that you want to read if you have not read i suspect that many of y'all have already read those but if you haven't you need to you need to get those as well um I'm, you're gonna see a little button that is our um donation button all of the work that we do is free and open to the community we know folks are in a lot of different places economically right now um so we always just want you to be here but if you do have you know a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars to throw our way. It really helps us um, pay for this platform and do our various outreach and pays for our support groups and things like that, which are also ongoing um, throughout the pandemic. So please check out our full calendar of events. Um, we're doing something almost every night of the week. Uh, so if you're wherever you are in the world, if you're lonely for feminist community, we got you. Um, come hang out and um, come, you get the chance to hang out with amazing writers, um, uh, like these folks. So thank you so much for a beautiful conversation, both of you. It was really amazing. I, I was watching the chat and folks were just, um, filled up by it. So yeah, I hope that you both stay safe and, um, 
we'll be looking out for the next thing but just enjoy this moment for now it's thank it's you. huge all right until next time thank you bye, bye.